One of the things that I've enjoyed as a dad is getting all sorts of questions from my kids. You guys have been there before as parents and as grandparents. Kids ask the strangest questions, don't they? And what I love is that now we have things like Siri and Google to help us with these questions. Uh, Ezra particularly is the most curious out of our two kids. Avery, sends, she's at the point now where she goes and looks for the answers on her own. But it seems like nearly every day or every other day, uh, Ezra asks Google the strangest of questions, like who is the oldest mascot in college football and things like that. And so I had a peculiar question. And I went to the, instead of going to other sources, I went to Siri and I asked Siri the question, where did religion come from? Um, and uh, of course, Siri as an AI, she doesn't really know that answer, so she sent me to all these different places on the internet to try to figure out where did religion come from. Now, that might not seem like an interesting question, but let's be honest, over seven out of eight people on this planet are connected to a religion. Uh, they wake up this morning and they are connected to a community that's been asking questions of religion for quite some time. And so scholars, if they want to study it or not, they need to come down to the bottom of the, uh, come to the bottom of this conclusion of this question. Where did all this begin? Now, some say that religion began because people began to understand that there are sources outside of ourselves that are, seem to be at work. Uh, there seems to be the proper balance of the rain that waters the earth and the fireball in the sky that goes across our skies. The balance of those two things help for crops to grow in the ground. And so we need to maybe worship and thank those gods for um, that sort of a balance. Some uh, went further and they said that there's a reason why some people are able to have children and not have children. So maybe we need to worship to those gods so that we can have children in future generations uh, for the sake of our family and for the sake of our communities and nations. Others said that we needed to go further and that there are um, enemies out there, other people groups that are after us. And so maybe they have gods that are against our gods. And so maybe we should worship our gods more so that our gods are more pleased than their gods and stronger than their gods so that we can be victorious in battle. But what we see is that as we study the way people worship God is that there was a quite a bit of uncertainty with that in mind. Because if you offered something on one day and it seemed to work, maybe you needed to offer that same exact same thing the next time around when it was time to worship. But if it didn't work, maybe that God is disappointed that you didn't offer him more than the last time. And so they began to offer more things, more grain and more animals and more costly things. It seemed quite uncertain to know if you were on the God's right side or on the God's wrong side. So there's this tenuous relationship with the gods. Another sociologist, Robert Bella, he said that actually thinks that perhaps the working of religion or the practice of religion came whenever plays began to happen in communities. And now we're not talking about, you know, elaborate Shakespeare plays with props and different things moving on a stage, but it could have started even as early as a dad of a household going to a cave wall and drawing things on the wall to talk about the stories from the past. And so as those stories were shared again and again in a play form where there was an audience, when there was a storyteller, people had a feeling of transcendence, like something was moving deep within them. I think we've had this feeling of transcendence when we go to a concert, perhaps. And for whatever reason, when that drummer does that drum solo, we are transported and something washes over us, a feeling of euphoria. Or perhaps it happens um, when we go to a military uh, exercise and we have this sense of nationalism higher than what's going on on the stage. And so there's something that draws us to these types of moments. And so um, religious scholars have suggested at some point when somebody was telling those stories and there was a crowd that was there, they said, there's something about this that we need to continue to do again and again. Can we do it another time soon to fill us with enthusiasm for our story ahead? You put those things together, and what we see as we study civilizations and cultures, there have been gatherings of people asking questions and telling stories and reading sacred texts and trusting proclamations of poets and preachers and songwriters, people all looking for something or many, many things that are out there to give us a reason and why we exist and how shall we continue to go forward. This has been something that has been at the forefront of people's thinking from the very beginning. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us what happens on day one of practicing of religion. It doesn't seem to be occupied with that governing question. Instead, the Bible is a persuasive argument. It's a persuasive book. It wants to persuade those who are worshiping one way uh, to, to seek a different and a better way. 
Uh, there seems to be this presupposition that worship is happening out there, but not all of it's healthy. Not all of it's hitting the mark. So what can we do from, to move from point A to point B to have a more fulfilling and a more true worship experience when worshiping the one true God? We see a picture of this in Genesis chapter 1, the very first page of our Old Testament text. And if you and I had to read Genesis chapter 1 from uh, verse 1 all the way to chapter 2 in those first few verses of chapter 2, we would see a rhythm and a process of the construction of Genesis chapter 1. It talks about the creation of all things. But you'll notice a pattern of things in Genesis chapter 1. you notice in the different days of creation, different things happen. And here's an illustration of what happens in Genesis chapter 1. On the first three days, you'll see that space is open. And, and the first day, there's this light and darkness that's separated from one another. On day 2, there is the expanse in the sky and the water beneath it. On day 3, there's the, a separation of water and the dry land that happens on day three. But then we go to day four. We go back to the light and to the dark. We have these governing lights that govern the darkness and that govern the daytime. Then you go to, you go to day five and you have things that fill that air and that fill the waters that were separated in day two. You go to day six and you have these different beings that are roaming around on the ground because there was a separation in day three from the waters and from the land. What scholars have suggested that we should see in Genesis chapter 1 is that in the first three days, space is opened up, and in the corresponding last half in those three days, those spaces are being filled. Scholars suggest that just like us building a house, we create spaces, then we fill those spaces. If there's a punchline, there's several punchlines, there's several things that the author of Genesis is trying to convey in Genesis chapter 1, but the one overarching thing is this, is that the whole world is a temple where God dwells. Every single bit of it. So this is a, a provocative idea because there tended to be at this time at the writing of Genesis chapter 1, there were sacred spaces, some places where people said, you go to that place and you can worship. But the writer of Genesis and the people of Israel had a different vision, not just in that particular space and that zip code and that address, but in all the world, you will encounter the God of the heavens and God of the earth, that the whole earth is bathed with the glory of God. And us as human beings are given the courage and the charge to enjoy all that God has made and to reflect God's glory back out into the world. That's the two things that God calls us to according to Genesis chapter 1. This is a fresh new vision. Instead of trying to figure out if the gods are happy with me or not, if I've worshipped all of them equally or not, to see if I've appeased the God of war and the God of offspring and the God of rain and the God of sun and the God of food. Instead of trying to know, instead of that tenuous idea, have I pleased all the gods the writer of Genesis says there's one God he's created all things and you can encounter him everywhere and this God says everything is good it's all good Unfortunately, this is a vision that didn't seem to stick very long. Because if there's, there's, a, there's a bit of a shadow to this story, because there's a chunk of scripture from Genesis 1 to Genesis 11 that's supposed to convey one idea, one story. Genesis 1 starts with this whole world being a place where we can encounter and enjoy God. But humanity begins to turn away from this, this God and abandon this God. We get to Genesis chapter 11, and we find that a community decides we're going to build a temple of our own, and we're going to kick God out of the picture we're supposed to see these two temples side by side. One is a temple where God can be experienced and enjoyed in every square inch where we might find ourselves. But in Genesis chapter 11, we have the pride of humanity saying, we're going to build a tower as tall as possible and do our own thing. What we see is God's story. God's love story with humanity has spiraled out of control. It's unraveled to where God now has to do something with creation. There's a governing question at the end of Genesis chapter 11, and that question is, what is God going to do with this mess in this creation project that is his world? Is God going to give up? Is God going to abandon? Is God just going to allow us to do our own thing, and is he not going to intervene? What we see in Genesis chapter 12 is that God sends a person, Abram. He says, I'm going to make you into a family. That family is going to become a nation. And that nation will bless all the nations of the earth. The question is, what will God do with the middle of all this mess? The answer is God wants to renew it from the very center of all of its mess. 
Now we continue in the story. Abraham's family becomes a plentiful nation. They find themselves as slaves in Egypt and God desires to free them from their slavery. And so he does so with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm. And he tries to bring them back into the place that he promised the forefather Abraham. But before they get into the promised land, God gives them a model to learn to worship again. At the very end of the book of Exodus, we had this long, long passage where many read the Bible in a year, plans go to die. It talks about all these diff- uh, meticulous measurements of a tent of meaning and all these different objects that are supposed to be placed in there and all these meticulous laws that have to be followed in order for worship to be done correctly among God's people. But it was all pointing towards something. At the end of the book of Exodus, chapter 40, verses 34 through 38, we have a a summary statement of how this worship takes place among God's people. It says, Then the cloud, which was God's presence, covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. In all the travels of the Israelites, wherever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day and the fire was in the cloud by night in the sight of all the Israelites during the travels. The question is, what's going on with this cloud and this pillar of fire and this tent of meeting? What's going on here? God's trying to retrain his people on the vision of worship. He's trying to convince them They don't need to go search in other places or try to build altars to other gods out there. But they can learn to worship him as the one creator God again. And so sure, we read through the book of Leviticus and we see that if this person commits this sin, they need to bring like a goat of a certain age and a pigeon of a certain age. And we look at that and we say, man, that seems really primitive and really archaic and seems maybe just kind of bizarre for us 21st century folks. But keep in mind, in their own context, this is a huge leap forward. Because what God is telling the people of Israel is that you don't have to wonder if you're at peace with God. If you follow these instructions, if you come worship here, you know that you have peace with God and peace with one another. And so they set up this advanced model of worship. And they were, God was training them to learn how to worship him and to reorder their loves and to trust in him again. But unfortunately, this wasn't going to be the permanent solution for all times. We go to the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. The book of Hebrews New Testament gives us a couple of data points about this form of worship. What the writer Hebrews says is that this was not able, this type of process of coming to the temple and offering animal sacrifices to be convinced of our forgiveness of sins, it wasn't able to cleanse our consciousness, but we still left with heavy hearts. We didn't know what was going to be next. It wasn't going to be the permanent solution because year after year, as people came to the temple and they offered their sacrifices, they went away going with some questions like, we have to do this every year. Are we getting any better or not? Are things getting better or not? So there was a question that emerged among the believing people. What's going to be next? Who can rescue us from our plight? Because the weight and the burden of our sins is still too heavy to bear. We have no idea of what it's going to be like in the days to come. Recently, I watched a cute Christmas film called Noel. It's on the Disney Plus channel. If you don't have Disney Plus, you can't watch this cute movie. So I encourage you at least to get the free version from Verizon if you can for a year and to watch this movie. But this movie presupposes a couple things. That the Santa enterprise is a family business. So that as one Santa Claus passes away, a new Santa Claus, one of his children, takes over as Santa Claus to continue Uh, the Santa Enterprise for all the households of the world. And so at the beginning of the movie, there's there's a bit of uh, an unknown because Santa has two children. He's got a son and he's got a daughter. And it's it's, it's presupposed that the son's supposed to take over as the next Santa Claus. I mean, he's already called Chris. And so it just seems to be natural that he should be the next Chris Kringle. And so the only thing is that as he tried to be trained up in the ways of Santa, it wasn't taking to him. In fact, as the movie goes on, he would rather be a yoga instructor in Phoenix, Arizona than to be Santa Claus that's riding a sleigh of reindeer to every household on the planet. So there's there's a bit of a conflict about what's going to happen next is, 
is Christmas going to be ruined because sand is not prepared and ready for the workload of Christmas this year? That's when the other child of the Claus household begins to realize that she's being summoned and called to take the role of Santa Claus. Now, it's a bit of a, as you can see the story, and I try not to ruin the movie for you, but it's a bit at the last hour that she decides to be Santa Claus, and so she puts on the Santa Claus suit, and it's way too big. I mean, she's a petite woman, and it's, it's basically like a, like a big blanket on her, and she looks at her mom, and she says, Mom, the suit doesn't fit. And her mom says, and it's the provocative line of the movie, the suit fits you when you fit it. There's a point when she's going through her first trial run of being Santa on Christmas Eve that a child sees her. And that when the child sees her and calls her Santa, that it dawns upon her that this is her destiny, that this is her role. And the suit automatically changes in its tailor fit to fit her figure exactly. And along with it, her confidence and the role ahead. I say that simply because this. As humanity was searching for a solution, what are we going to do with our lingering guilt of sin issue? They were looking for someone who the suit would fit. And what we see in John chapter 1, that the suit fits Jesus. That Jesus is the one who brings, who brokers this lingering and permanent peace with God. You'll notice in John chapter 1, as in verses 9 through 13, as the author John is talking about Jesus' ministry. He says this of Jesus. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Born, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. This is what John is saying. That as humanity was searching for a solution, searching for the answer who would give us, who would lead us finally to that rest that we're all searching for? That it wasn't the lingering ministry of the temple. That it wasn't ling the lingering words of Moses. No, someone greater than all those things was arriving in God's world. And we find that uniquely in Jesus. Jesus is now the place where God and humanity meet. Jesus is the place where you and I enter the rest with God. Jesus is the place where you and I can know that we can have forgiveness of sins, that we're actually integrated into God's family as we have a living encounter, a transforming encounter with Jesus himself. And John tells us that this is, this is not just something that's happening in familiar places like the temple, but it's happening everywhere in the world again, just like Genesis 1 was trying to communicate to us. So John's got all these crazy stories after this proclamation of what Jesus is up to, that Jesus is truly the person where God and humanity meet. He shares of a time where a couple of his early disciples are discussing about Jesus of Nazareth. And, and Nathaniel, one of his early disciples, has a little bit of doubt that anything that good can come from Nazareth. But the unfortunate thing is that they're having that conversation a long ways away from where Jesus could listen. But as Jesus encounters Nathaniel, he tells Nathaniel that he was there with them in their conversation, even though he wasn't there with them in their conversation that under a shade of a poplar tree, perhaps Jesus was there with them. There's a story of when Jesus goes to a wedding in Cana, the first miracle that Jesus does where he takes water and he turns it into wine, famously the Presbyterian's favorite miracle of Jesus in John chapter 2. But you'll notice that even in a common celebration like a wedding and an unfortunate um, circumstance where the wine runs out, Jesus is there with the solution and people encounter the living God in the middle of a wedding festival. John tells us of a conversation with a spiritually curious person named Nicodemus who knows all the scriptures, but he still doesn't have peace in his heart. And Jesus encounters him. And there Nicodemus meets the face of the living God for the first time in the middle of the night. John tells us further that Jesus wanders outside of the boundary lines where a good Jewish boy like him is supposed to go. He goes to Samaria and he encounters a woman under the noonday sun at a well, a woman with a checkered history. And as she is a spiritual seeker, she's got spiritual things to talk about. She encounters the living God there, even though it wasn't culturally appropriate for that type of conversation to happen. What John is telling us from story after story is that once again, we don't have to go all the way down to the big temple in Jerusalem in order to meet that God face to face. 
we now meet that God face to face in Jesus Christ. All this leads us to a question as modern day worshipers in the 21st century. So what? What does that mean for us? I mean, you've talked about Genesis chapter one. You've talked about the, the time in the first century in John's gospel. You, you talk about that. You're kind of waxing eloquent about this philosophical question of where did religion begin? What does this mean for us? Well, if we can truly encounter God everywhere, then, Chris, then Christmas, the season of Christmas, should reorient the Christian people to be courageous in the midst of uncertain times. If God can be encountered in a manger in Bethlehem among the poor and forgotten people, citizens of Nazareth, he can be encountered at a wedding festival or in a midnight conversation with Nicodemus or in a noonday sun conversation with a woman with a checkered pass at a, a, a well in Samaria. We can encounter God everywhere around us. This world isn't a scary place that we need to abandon but it's a place that we need to engage in because the living God has turned loose and he's everywhere around us. We can encounter him in all places, not just in sacred places like a sanctuary at your favorite church, but we can encounter him everywhere that we could possibly imagine. What Christmas allows us as the people of God to imagine is that we can journey out into this world with a boldness and with a courage and to not look back and to take it as it is and to embrace it and to know that the living God is going to show up today as he showed up in days prior. Uh, there's a preacher named Brian Zahn, and he's got this amazing poem about Advent that highlights this idea of how we shouldn't be scared of the world around us. And I shared this at the Adventures Lunch on Thursday, but it was so good. I need to share with it on Sunday morning as well. This is what Brian Zahn says about what Christmas means, and it's significant for us as Christian believers. He says, I take the world as it is and still believe. Debauched and beautiful, sordid and seemly. Rekuriak is a secular saint, had heard uncensored telling his story. On the road with Dean Moriarty, in the long run, Merton took a better turn, but the beat still goes. Goes on. Take your stand on whatever smidgen of faith you have. Smack dab in a world of hustlers and hookers, users and losers, liars and lovers. Don't waste your life on a pastel watercolor faith that runs if touched by a tear or a drop of sweat. Can you take the world as it is and still believe in God? Can you take people as they are and still believe in love? Or do you only play at make believe? A world of terracotta saints, of little houses on soundstage prairies. So not at home in the world as it is that you can't wait for it to be all left behind. That, my friend, is no real faith. It's scripted B-movie phoniness, rated G for gullible audiences. A real faith lives in a real world. The world as it is, sordid and seemly, debauched and beautiful, it's the little town of Bethlehem, good enough for the Son of God. This is what it means for us, that we don't do passive-aggressive sighs when we hear the brokenness of the world around us, but that we don't avert our eyes from the tough things in this world, because the Son of God didn't. Because the writer of Genesis tells us that this God is alive and loose, and he's everywhere that we can imagine he might be found. So what we here on Christmas and how we're oriented on Christmas is to run back out into this world, not afraid, but full of courage and full of faith, understanding this God shows up in all places where we find ourselves. May the God of Christmas find that faith in us during this Christmas season.